from Matthew chapter 25, beginning at verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He'll put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes, and clothe you? When did we see you sick, or in prison, and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly, I tell you, whatever you did, for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry, or thirsty, or a stranger, or needing clothes, or sick, or in prison, and did not help you? He will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This story is in the same context as last week's. We talked about a business owner putting his investments, putting his servants, his employees, and giving them responsibility as he took a long journey. And we talked about the fact that someday that business owner, that landowner was going to come back. And those employees were going to have to give an account for their lives and that they would fall into one of two groups. Those who played to win and those who played to not lose. Those who invested what they had been given to make a difference and those who buried their talents, their resources in the ground. We talked about the fact that that this all falls into into the context of Jesus preparing his disciples, saying, I am going away, I am going to leave you, and someday I am coming back, and I am going to come before, I am going to do an audit, I'm going to conduct an audit on your life, and so here is what you need to be focusing on while I'm gone. That's what Matthew chapter 25 is all about. Here's what you need to be doing while I'm away, because I am coming back. And in this parable, he tells us what the, the whole point of this is 
when He comes back, all of us, you and me, we're going to fall into one of two groups. The sheep who saw the needs of people around them and used the resources that they had to make a difference to do something about those needs. And the goats who either refused to see or refused to do anything about it. And to those who saw the needs and were willing to do what they could, there's this this jubilation, this celebration. Come in and receive the inheritance that has been prepared for you you since the beginning of creation. And for the goats, completely different story. But the point is simple. You and I, are going to give an account and we are going to be either a sheep or a goat. That's the story. I didn't write it. If you don't like it, take it up with the author. But there's no in-between. There's no yeah buts. There's no fine print. That's it. One or the other. It's black or white in this situation. There's no plan B. Do you, do you, are you feeling me on that? I'll I'll tell you what, I don't like to do black and white stuff. It comes across as harsh. But here's the reality. And I'm going to be very transparent with you today. Because I have a confession to make. As I've thought about this and prepared for this, this is something that God has been preparing me for for longer than I even knew it. And my journey with what we're talking about today and understanding this parable, I have taught on this I don't know how many times. I've taught through Matthew and and it didn't hit me. It didn't wreck me. I could deal with it intellectually. And I'll tell you why I'm, I'm so passionate about this because my story with this begins in January of 2011 when God brought a little girl into my life she's sitting right over there You see, I've learned that God's going to get our attention one way or the other. When God wants your attention, sometimes it's a crisis that He uses to hit you upside the head. Sometimes it's a blessing. But through her, I realized something. I've spent most of my life as a goat. I've been a goat. Now that doesn't surprise some of you who know me very well. You say, yeah, you're pretty stubborn. We already had that figured out. But in this sense of this parable, I was a goat. I could drive past certain neighborhoods in our community and turn my nose up and more or less, not so much cognitively, but but deep down, there was a part of me that was saying, they're the problem. They're a drain on our social system. These people, they don't even belong here. I was a goat. And it took God bringing a little girl named Marta who just by loving us reached up and took the blinders off of my eyes so I could see so I could see the things that I hadn't wanted to see could no longer ignore these children. 
could no longer ignore these needs. You see, I, I've been, I don't know how many global leadership summits I've been to and other conferences, and, and the, I've heard the compassion pitches, the, the world vision pitches. I've walked past the tables with the sponsorship packets out there, and I always had good excuses. I could look at that and think, I can't afford that. I can't do anything about that right now. I don't have the money to do that right now. I've got my own kids that I'm responsible for. I can't afford that. Maybe someday, maybe someday when my kids are grown, I'll have the resources and I can do that. And in the meantime, somebody else will pick this up. Somebody else will take care of these kids. It's not my responsibility. Enter Marta. Stage right. And then through the Willow Creek Association, we became a host site for the GLS, and I got to know Jimmy Miato, who's now the president of Compassion International. And through those interactions, I got a letter one day inviting me to go to Guatemala and see the work of Compassion International up close and personal. And you saw through the pictures, you know, we, we went to the sites, we visited in homes. I had seen commercials and heard the pitches. I had never seen poverty like that ever in my life. I was very blessed. I grew up in a middle class home, went to private colleges, married my college sweetheart. God has blessed us. We've had a good life. And, and when that's the case, when that's the way you live, it's very easy to become a goat. It just sort of happens. It's not intentional. You don't decide, I want to be a goat. It just sort of happens. And I'm down there and I'm meeting with these kids and I'm surrounded by them and they're, the, the people that are working with them, the employees, the volunteers, I, I see how all of this process works. I see the, the organization and the packets of each of these children. And I mean, these people, it is amazing how dedicated they are to these kids. And, and every kid has a folder and it's got his, his or her birth certificate and school records and family situation and financial situation and where they are in their faith journey because they only work through the local church and all these health records, all of these different things in this folder this thick and it hit me I'm a goat I'm a goat and I don't want to be a goat anymore because you know, when, it, when it's all said and done, and I looked at that, and I looked at these kids, it, it hit me, you know? Kids are kids. You know, I, I grew up singing the song, red or yellow, black and white, they are precious and it's like, you know? And you know that cognitively, but somewhere along the way, you have different kinds of interactions and certain prejudices that set in that you don't even realize are there till something happens and God takes the scales off your eyes so that you can see it. And I realized, you know, kids are kids. Whether they're born in, blessed to be born in America or in Guatemala or in Africa or Haiti or Thailand or wherever it might be, kids are kids. And they have, they have the same needs my kids have and they deserve the same thing my, my kids. You know, Health care and, and an education and, and an opportunity to, to meet Jesus and, and know that he loves them and has a plan for their life. Every kid needs to have a, a, a safe place to live. And the knowledge that somebody, somebody cares about me. Somebody is investing in me. Somebody loves me enough to sacrifice for me. That's my journey. And it's ongoing. The reality is, there's a lot of kids that don't have anybody 
like that in their lives. We got those statistics available? Let's throw those up there, Joan. I just want you to think about some numbers for a minute. The statistics. There we go. Nine million children under the age of five die each year. Two-thirds of these deaths, more than six million every year, six million children are dying from preventable causes. Next one. 1.4 billion people in the developing world live below the poverty line less than $1.25 a day, U.S. In developing countries, approximately 130 million children and teenagers, 17 or under, have lost one or both parents. Folks, it's so easy for us to lose sight of these kinds of things. I mean, you know, we hear about this, this, this tragedy in Nevada this week, and it was awful, and I'm not taking anything away from that. But I didn't hear anybody on any of our news channels or the APY or anything else talk about the fact that that every 30 seconds somewhere in the world a child dies from malaria. A preventable and treatable disease every 30 seconds. So if we're in this service for an hour, 120 children in that hour will die from malaria somebody's child. Twenty-two thousand children die every day due to the conditions of poverty that they live in. Twenty-two thousand children a day. Let that reality sink in. If you're like me, you hear those numbers, you see those statistics, and you think, you know what? But Jim, I mean, that's horrible, I hate that, but I don't have the resources. I don't have the resources in my life to affect the lives of 22,000 children, much less millions of children. I, I, I don't have the money to do that, and you're right. But what winds up happening is we see those kind of staggering numbers. We realize, I can't affect the trajectory of millions of kids. It's just too overwhelming. So as a reality, we wind up not doing anything. Because you're right. None of us can afford to do something for hundreds of kids, much less millions of kids. But here's what God has taught me. I don't have the money. We don't have the money to to affect hundreds of kids. But we can change the trajectory one. We can do something about one. Now two. <laughs> we, we can do this. We can do this. And here's, here's the beauty of that. Here's the beauty of partnering with an organization like Compassion. According to an outside secular study conducted by some folks at the University of San Diego, this is not Compassion Statistics, when you and I invest in the life of one child, when we sponsor a child... Ultimately, that gift touches 30 other people. There are 30 other people who are impacted by that sponsorship. So so just think about this for a minute. Here's the beauty of what happens. This is our sponsor kid. Her name is Elvira. She's one of nine children. She lives in the mountains of Guatemala. She was in the center that I visited, but I didn't get to meet her. She was there that day, but we began sponsoring her after I was there. She's 12 years old. You can only be sponsored between age 3 and 9, so by virtue of the fact that she's 12, it means that somewhere along the way her sponsor dropped out on her for whatever reason. So we picked her up. And here's what I know. I know through our sponsorship of Elvira, 
we're touching 30 other people. And when Bill sponsors a child, that sponsorship touches 30 other people. And when Rachel sponsors a child, that sponsorship touches 30 other people. And when people around this room and people in the other building and people in Tennessee and Georgia and Great Britain and South Korea begin to sponsor children in the same community, that impact grows from 30 to 60 to 90. So when just 20 children are sponsored out of one community, do the math, how many lives are being touched? 600 from 20 sponsorships. You see how that works? It's a beautiful thing. And today, we have that opportunity. We have the privilege of partnering with Christ to be a part of changing the world, to make a difference, possibly between life and death, potentially impacting a child's eternal destiny for $38 a month. 38 bucks a month. Now, I know, you know, I used to sit back at $38 a month, and here's what I've learned. You know what $38 a month is? It's less than what it takes for me to take my family out to lunch today. I can't feed my family for $38 out to dinner. So it's one meal at home eating soup and sandwiches, and we've paid for the sponsorship. How can I not do it? How can I not? And look in the mirror. And someday, give an account for my life over $38 a month. Not a guilt trip, just my thought process. So I want to see if you have any questions. We had some great questions in early service. Terry, you got microphone back there, don't you? Um, if anybody has any questions, I'd, I'd, I'd be glad to just throw them out there. I'd be glad to, to answer those. Bill has a microphone, too. Yes, ma'am. Bill, you got one, too? Yes, ma'am. Oh, yes, I do. Okay. I want to see where you come up with the number 30. I'm sorry? Where you came up with the number 30. The $38 a month? No, the 30 people. Oh, that was a, a study done by the University of San Diego. That, that did the research, and actually Compassion is the only group that does child sponsorships that was willing to allow, and they opened up their books and said, come look at everything that we do, go through it with a fine-tooth comb, look at the work that we're doing around the world in 120 some odd different countries, and, and analyze whether or not what we're doing is effective. And that group from that research learned that every sponsorship affects 30 lives. They've looked at it, they've looked at how that affects the impacts of the family, the community, you know, so you're, you're sponsoring a, a family for $38 a month. Well, guess what? Somewhere along the lines, they need a new roof. Well, somebody, how are they going to pay for that new roof? It's by the money that we send there. And so somebody's got a job putting a roof on a house that they wouldn't have had otherwise. Those kinds of things have an impact across, across the globe. There are ripple effects to it. Yes, ma'am. Does compassion ever pull out of a community that they've started working with? Not that I'm aware of. And okay. I don't know the answer to that question, but I've never heard of that happening. Okay. Another um, organization did, and we lost our child, so... I don't... I haven't heard of that happening. Okay. See, th another thing with Compassion that's different than some other organizations, I'm not, I'm not belittling the work that anyone else does, but Compassion works exclusively through the local church. So when you sponsor a child, that child comes to the center two to three days a week. It's in a church. Where, and I've met the pastors. The people are there. And, and so there's a, there's a spiritual aspect. So they're not going to be at work in areas where there are not churches. Does that make sense? It's only done through the local church. We had one question in the early service I thought was real good. I'll go ahead and just throw one out there. How often do we write our children? Well, I wrote a letter to Elvira last night. You went right through the website. I put three pictures on there, wrote her a letter. It'll be translated. I know the translator because she's in Guatemala, and I know, I've met the translators. That letter will be delivered to her 
and then we'll be waiting for a letter from her. One of the things that I want to do with this I think will be really cool. One of the reasons that I've asked for a lot of packets from Guatemala is because if we as a church, both services, sponsor a number of kids from the, from the same region, then we can take a trip down there together, go visit our kids, do some mission work in the process, and in the meantime... December 1st is the first one, but at least every quarter, I want to have letter writing parties right after this service where we gather together, maybe down in Rock Stadium or the cafeteria, because it's not just about the $38 a month, it's about a relationship, it's about being able to say to these kids, hey, we're praying for you, we're interacting with you, we want to know what's going on in your life, it's, it's, we're going to talk more about that in a minute, but, but at least four times a year, because there's some folks that sponsor kids and don't write them. I won't call them by name. I could. I won't. I won't pick on anybody. But this is important. And so we're going to get together. Folks from both services will share the letters that we've gotten from our kids and we'll write our letters together as a way of doing this together as a church family. I saw another hand right over here. Jan. I told Terry I couldn't pass it up. <clears throat> A lot of you guys know I've never been married, so I don't have kids. But these are my boys. I grew up in Ethiopia. My birth father was in the military, and I watched flies being like this off of food before people bought them. So my first boy, Zalem, has graduated from Compassion. I was a sponsor for 12 years, and now I have EPSA who I've had since he was four, and he's now 11. So my first pictures and letters were just pictures he drew. But I re-looked at his Christmas letter from last year, and his um, present that he bought, because I sent him a gift, was a football. I thought, well, that's good for a boy. But then he bought soap for a bath. I've never bought soap when I was a kid. My mom and dad gave me soap. I would never have thought of spending Christmas money on soap for a bath. So. You just get these letters, and they're like my kids. I hang them up. There's one of the letters is hanging out there. So it will change your life. And for me being single, it's like I got two sons. So that was always pretty cool. <laughs> Thanks, Jan. <laughs> Any other questions? Yes, sir. What are other ways that I can help sponsor a child without it involving money out of my pocket? Oh, that's a good question. I actually had someone in the early service say, you know, I'm not sure I can do this by myself. And so um, I, I encouraged that person to partner with someone else so that um, a few of those, a few people could get together and, and sponsor a child. That's one, one way if cash is, if, if finances are an issue. Um, you might find somebody who has a sponsor kid and, and say, hey, can I help you with your letter writing? I'll be glad to write some letters and, and do that with you. I don't know. Let me noodle that some more. That's a good question. I hadn't had that one asked yet. Um, but I, I appreciated Jan bringing up the, 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 the idea of gifts. It's in addition to the $38 a month, if, if you want to, when it comes to birthdays and Christmas and those kinds of things, you can send a gift along. They, it's almost better not to try to buy something and send it because the reality is when you add a little bit of cash to your to your monthly gift, they can do a lot more with it down there than we can do with it here. They know what the needs are. For every Compassion kid, there is a representative in their center that has a very small number, three or four children that they relate to, and that it's almost like a caseworker. That caseworker is in that home every month so they know what's going on with the family, they know what's going on with the child, they know what the needs are, and they can make the decisions on the ground as to what happens. Now, out of every 30, when, you, when you're doing, some people ask me this too, on the $38, how much of it, how much of the money gets to the child? 17 cents on every dollar goes to overhead. And Compassion's bylaws state that it can never be more than 20 cents. So at this point, right now, 83 cents of every dollar makes it to the kids, the 17 cents that has to happen for the work that needs to be done behind the scenes to pull this thing together. But for any gifts that you give for birthday or Christmas or whatever, there is no overhead cost to any of that. The entire amount goes directly to the child. So every amount over the $38 is the, the, whole, the whole amount gets to the, to the kid. So that was just a, another question that came up in the early service. 
Any other burning questions, I'll be available afterwards and I'll do everything I can to try to answer those. But I, want, I have a story that I want to share with you as we wrap this up. <clears throat> can we throw the picture up there? Of uh, There we go. Um, I don't know if you can see my pointer or not. This is Kevin. Kevin's a compassion kid. He's in the second site that we went to up in the mountains outside of Guatemala City. This is his brother, Josue, sister, Anne-Marie, and mother, Anna. Dad works agriculture, makes about, when he, when he gets to work, makes the equivalent of $7 a day. Family of five. And Anna was talking about how difficult it has been to try to keep Anne-Marie healthy because, and, and I can get it, I mean, we're visiting there in the home, it's dirt floor, corrugated steel roof, cardboard walls, you saw the pictures of the home earlier, there is no door, flies everywhere, and I know why, because you step out and you go around this little, little kind of courtyard area and there's the latrine, which is a hole in the ground, and just beyond that, there's pens full of turkeys and farm animals, it was like nothing I had ever seen before. Um, but as we're talking with Anna, we asked her, I, I asked her how we could pray for her, what their needs were, and she, she looked at me through the translator and said that she and her husband fight a lot because there's no money. And she needs money to take care of the kids. And he's working, but there's no money. And it causes a lot of arguments. Does that sound familiar to anybody? But it sounded a little darker than that even more. And, and I asked, what do you need? Is there anything that I can do for you? And um, she said, you know, Kevin, this little guy, would love to have a plastic, uh, plastic bowl like the other kids, but we've never been able to afford one. A plastic bowl. And I think, what is that? Use it like a helmet or something? You know, what, what's the plastic? And so as we were walking back to the center, we were, had to go through the market, you know, and there's the blue tarps, and, and everybody's laughing at the gringo grande walking through because my shoulders are bumping the tarps and the water's running down on me, you know. <laughs> yeah. But we walked past this lady with bowls. And I said to the translator, is this what, uh, what Anna was talking about, these bowls? And she said, no, a ball, a plastic ball. Oh, duh, okay, a ball. Okay, that makes a lot more sense. And I said, well, where can we get one of these plastic balls? She said, at a store. I said, okay, where's the store? She said, right over there. I said, I'm after you. Let's go. So we walked over to the store, and I walk in, and there's a bag with these plastic balls. And... Um, I said, is this what she's talking about? Yes, that's what she's talking about. How much are they? Well, if I were Guatemala, they probably would have been a nickel apiece. But as a gringo, they were 50 cents apiece. <laughs> so I gave the guy a dollar. I bought two. Walked back to the center. A little while later, Kevin came in. I saw him. As soon as he got there, he was sitting down on the end by himself. And after their presentation, I motioned to him, and he came over, and I knelt down on the ground, concrete floor. You know, sidebar, <laughs> when I think about some of the stuff that we stress out about, you know, when it's cold in Guatemala, you know what they do? They put on a sweater. When it gets hot, they take it off. Somehow I don't think they come into church and complain about how hot or cold it is. I just don't think they do. Somehow when you don't have anything in the windows, I don't think you're worried about how hot and cold it is. Seems like maybe that's a first world problem. Maybe. But at any rate, I knelt down and Kevin came over and I had the bag and I gave it to him. I said, Uno por tu, uno por Josué. One for you, one for your brother. That little boy threw those arms, those little arms around my neck and just held on. Just held me for the longest time. I mean, you'd have thought I'd given him the Hope Diamond. And the, the bus was loading and getting ready to leave and I couldn't peel Kevin off of me. I thought, okay, I'm taking another one home. Here we go. <laughs> Honey, I'm bringing another one home. He won't let go. 
And I was sitting out on the bus, and I saw him pass from across the street to, from the church building over to where he goes to his class for the center. And he was carrying these, like I would instruct a tailback to carry the football. You know, it was just like this. Like somebody was going to take him away from him. Like it was the most precious thing. A 50-cent ball. But you know what that ball represented? Hope. Hope. It wasn't about the ball. It was that somebody cares enough about me to do something for me. That ball, and and ultimately, that's what sponsorship is about. It's about hope. It's, It's saying to a child, there's more to life than what you've experienced. God has a plan and a purpose for your life, and he sent his son Jesus to make it happen. And I love you, and there are people who care about you. And in the letters that we write, that we have opportunities to communicate that over and over and over again, we have a chance to communicate that message today. You don't have to go to the gangs. You don't have to resort to crime. You don't have to live the way you've always lived. You have hope. There is a better life out there, and I want to help you make that happen. That's what it's about. What did Jesus say? Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did it for me. You have an opportunity today. Someone asked me in the early service, what, what, do, I, what, what do I get out of this? <laughs> My question back to him was, well, you want to be a sheep or a goat? Bah. You have an opportunity today to say, I want to be a sheep. Sign me up. I want to use what God has given me to make an eternal difference in the life of a child. It's not a sales pitch. Folks, I hope you see this is something that God has just wrecked me about. We are so blessed. Not a one of us here today is not going to have food on the table tonight or or lay down tonight with water dripping on our heads from a leaky roof. 